Good morning. Thank you for getting up early on the last day of the conference. Really, really appreciate it. Um, we will show our gratitude by giving you some really good information. My name is David Pincus. This is Charles Zahn. Uh, I'm the VP of Engineering. He's our Chief Data Scientist. Some of the data we're going to show you is in a smaller font. So you might want to get a little closer if you want to see some of the stats and um, you know, ranges of numbers that we're talking about. Okay. So I will start the presentation. Charles will join me uh, in a little bit. Okay. No. Well, no, no you join me now. No. Or, okay. No, no. Um, in a little <laughs> bit. And we, know, we'll, uh, we love questions, so feel free to ask them as we go along. Cool. So quick disclaimer, we're not going to share any information about any one specific account or app or instance, right? This is billions of email uh, messages, all aggregated, all anonymized. So if there's any secret sauce you have, don't worry. Nothing like that is getting disclosed. Okay, so I have some warm-up questions. Get us all awake and alert. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how we did some of this research, this data, some of the variables we used, um, promotion keywords, how to show appreciation to your customers, when you should personalize, when you should send your email out. Really interesting. We actually tend to not send it out when our customers are reading. So I'll give you some tips on how we can make those things work out. Uh, and then frequency, why people are opting out, and then the impact of uh, double opt-in, which is also really interesting. So quick question. How much email do you think we send annually? Just call it out. C. C, 13 billion? Good guess. Right, awesome. So that was last year. We're actually trending for a bit more uh, this year, which is, which is kind of awesome to think about, just you know, how many servers are spinning up and messages going out and what's going on. And we're seeing some of that traffic shift to other communication paradigms. And I would expect over the next couple of years, we'll see even more ways to communicate with customers, like SMS and Instagram and Pinterest and stuff like that. Uh, if you've looked at your email lists, what percentage of your customers are using Gmail? What do you think? Call it out. 39? I heard of 50. Any other guesses? 39%. Good guess. I wish I had prizes for you. Sorry. Um, if I was selling you something, I would give you prizes, but I'm just like, you know, sharing great information. So, uh, yeah, about 39%. Charles, does this cover like Gmail for your domain or this is just at gmail.com? At gmail.com. Ah, so it actually could be higher, right? Because like my personal email address is a Google app for my domain. So we should, we'll look at that next year and see how we can even get that. So I suspect it's going to trend even higher. Um, just for your edification, Yahoo and Hotmail are shared at about 13% each. Um, and then a very, very distant fourth is AOL. Who had an AOL account? Come on, who got those discs in the mail? <laughs> you know you did. Who, who decorated your closet with all the CDs you got? All right, that was a little nerdy, okay, but I, I had like rows of AOL CDs, I thought it was fun. Uh, and Comcast, and then you know everybody else is a, a much smaller amount after that. All right, so uh, we can send up to 300 emails per second, which is pretty good. Uh, the top app sends over 100 million email messages a year, something to shoot for. Um, this is really intriguing. There's one recipient across all of our customers, all of our apps, that gets 481,000 email messages. So not sure what that is. It's either a test account or somebody doing something interesting. Uh, oh, and the, the thing screwed up. All right, I was going to ask you to guess the busiest day of the year, but it didn't render exactly right. So you can, <laughs> see, you can see the tip there. So an average day is about 35 million email messages. Cyber Monday was 80 million emails that one day. So pretty good, more than two, almost two and a half times. Um, and on average, Email addresses appear in one and a half apps, meaning that you share your customers on average one and a half times with everybody else in our system. So, and that was where the Cyber Monday was going to be revealed. Okay, so we looked at um, 3 million broadcasts, 30 billion email messages sent over several lifetimes. Um, and this is just opens, okay? So in the future, we'll look at click-throughs, we'll look at revenue correlated with it, but you have to start with something, right? You have to get people to look at your email first before you can give them an offer, have them click through or something. So we're just going to look at opens today, but we'll be back next year and we'll share more information. And then we'd love if afterwards you came up to us and said, you know what, next year I'd like to see X, Y, and Z, and we'll, we'll do the research on that. All right, so here's where we start to get into some of the really interesting uh, features of just life and numbers and data sets. So you'll see that we're going to break down the bands of recipients instead of like 1 to 50 and 51 to 100. As it turns out, the, the distribution of your data does not look like that at all. So half of any range of numbers seems to go from like 1 to 32, and then the next half is 33 to 100. And that follows through. So between 10 and 100, 
between 10 and 32 is half, your, half the number of lists, and then 33 to 100 is the next half, and it goes up and up and up from there. And so if you're interested in that stuff, because it's just really intriguing how a lot of life follows sort of normal logarithmic things and, and the physical universe is, is connected, it's really just cool stuff. So um, look up the geometric mean or Zips law. Benford's law is really interesting. You can detect fraud in your applications looking at the frequency of the first digit in transactions or numbers. So if you want to look for accounting fraud, if you see a distribution of numbers and it doesn't favor the ones and the twos and the threes, there might be something going on. They use this to identify Twitter fraud. So Twitter bots, if they have a number of subscribers that doesn't follow Benford's law, they generally know it's a bot. So check these things out, it's really intriguing. Um, and you'll see that your data follows these laws um, you know, really, really regularly. The Zips law and the Zip mystery is really good. Vsauce has a great YouTube video on that that just will blow your mind. All right, so let's get into some of the, the helpful, useful things. So list size, specifically broadcast size. Lots of us have very large lists, but how many people should you be sending it to in any one distribution? So we went across the, the corpus of broadcasts, and we looked at it. And here you see the ranges of the 30 to 100, 100 to 30, 320, et cetera, et cetera. So you actually see a pretty nice distribution. So we'll give you data on all of these different um, recipients or sizes in the list. What you'll see, though, is even though the number of recipients and the number of broadcasts correlates to these different bands, the open rate is dramatically different for them. You might be able to predict what would happen. And you know, pretty predictably, the open rate is dramatically different on a smaller list. Okay, or a smaller broadcast, not a list, but a smaller broadcast. And we're seeing really large numbers. You know, if, if your list is 32 to 100, 48% of the time people are opening the email, that's remarkable, right? But as you get to these giant, giant lists, of course, it's going to go down. But why, right? Does it necessarily have to or need to? So we, we'll take a, little, a look at a little bit more data and then talk about some of the reasons why. So if, uh, if you have a group about 320 to 1,000, okay, so the second half of, of that range, um, the, the, uh, the mean open rate is about 30%, okay? The standard deviation is, is skewing. You see more of it on the left side. It's about 0.12. Um, but, you know, a large chunk of people are opening it somewhere between, you know, 10% and 30% of the time, and then it, it trails off at the top. Um, that's not bad. That's actually pretty decent for a list of that size. We do have differences in industry as predictable. Now, these are not like the highest industries or the lowest industries. Just give you a sample that there is variance in the industry. Um, fitness, of course, is more, uh, uh, more present uh, for a lot of people, so we're going to have a, a higher click-through rate there. Um, and you can see they're, they're skewing up really, really pretty high. Um, law attorneys, lawsuits, things like that are, are lower. But just as a, a sample of some of the differences between the industries. But the, the lesson here is this, that Selectivity does matter. If you can segment your list into smaller tagged lists and customize the messages accordingly, you generally will get a better open rate. Now, this is not a causal relationship, okay? So if you can't meaningful, meaningfully segment your lists, you don't have to do it. But um, if you can find a way to segment your list, which should result in you customizing it to make it more relevant for that small group of people, then do it. Date segmentation is actually a pretty easy way to do it. Like, thank you for signing up in May, right? Or, hey, we see you sign up in the last month, or we see you sign up three months ago. Easy way to do it, and it's just going to inspire you to customize your list a little bit more. So we'll get into why some of these things actually wind up their, uh, getting their way through spam filters or getting the attention of people. Basic idea is don't try to blast out to too many people at once. It's, it's going to be trapped. It's going to be ignored. It's just not going to get through all of the filters along the way, and it's not going to be as appealing or interesting to your customers. All right, um, I worked for Google many years ago, and so this was a question I was, I was often asked. Um, but let me ask you to start. What's, what's Google's product? What do they really do? Just shout it out. Search, ads, trust. So Google's product is trust. So this was drilled into us when we worked there. You trust that when you type something into Google, the answer you will get back, which may be an ad, right? It may be an image, it may be a product, you trust that it's going to be the best response to your query, okay? They protect that with an army of engineers, right? So this is, this is right from their site. The brand is only as strong as their users trust, which they defend by fighting spam, fraud, and abuse. So if you send an email and it's not trustworthy, there are literally thousands of engineers who will make sure it does not get to your customers because they can't afford to have the platform's trust reputation degrade. 
So think about that. Every time you're crafting anything to go out, is this a trustworthy email message? So this, again, one of the most common questions I got, how can I improve my page ranking? So there are two answers. One is RTFM, read the friggin' manual. They tell you, google.com slash webmaster. They give you, honestly, everything you need to know for great SEO. And then send something really relative. Um, and then yesterday, this was great too, right? The, talk to your customers like family. Just keep it simple, straightforward communications. Ask them what they want, and then give them what they ask for. The number one subject line in President Obama's re-election campaign in 2012. What was that subject line? Anybody know? <coughs> hey. That had the number one open rate. Just hey coming from Barack Obama. Um, because they tested that a lot, right? So it's, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about testing too, but um, keep it simple. Talk to them like family. Make it extremely trustworthy. Make it so that if you read this email, you would want to open it and do business and engage with that company. All right, so let's talk about the keywords. Let's get into some of the, the data we saw. Lots and lots of words appear in subject lines, your name, uh, contact information, new, week, webinar, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what do you think of this? Last chance. It appears in at least one out of 100 email messages. One out of four of you use it. Compares to emails or compared to emails sent to the same people. What do you think? Does it work? Yeah? It's actually one of the worst phrases you can use. Okay. Do you feel good when somebody says it's the last chance to do this? I don't, right? A little bit of remorse if you miss it. It's just, it's not, it's not a trustworthy thing. So uh, three quarters of the broadcasts that go out that have that word have a worse open rate than normal. Uh, and here is it. And you can see, you can see where, you know, normal is or average is the zero in the middle, right? But overwhelmingly, it's way worse than not using it, Okay. So if you, if you walk away with nothing else, don't use last chance in your subject line, okay? And we'll give you more other better things to do. But I love that actually you thought it was good because a lot of times conventional wisdom is very different than what the data actually shows. And at the end of the day, the data rules, the data trumps, okay? Um, so same for all the recipients. It was consistent no matter what the size of the list. Um, the control, the open rate was always higher than people using last chance. Okay. Uh, so what's better? What should you use? If you want to instill some sense of urgency, if you want to get your people to act, what words might be better? Save now? I'm not sure if I feel that good about that. I don't know. <laughs> so as it turns out, important is actually pretty good. Urgent, urgency is pretty good. Final, not so bad. Last is terrible. And this is for small groups, right, 32 to 100. Um, and, and you can see, you know, this is the area where there's, um, uh, where we're not sure, right? Sometimes better, sometimes worse. Um, even when the list size gets bigger, important is good, urgent, urgency, good, final, last, not so good. Okay, so don't use last chance. Uh, important is better than urgent. Urgent's okay, but important is, is way better. Um, final's not a great word. Last is not a great word. Um, and it even feels right, doesn't it? Like if you see an email message, you know, last chance is just, it doesn't feel like something that is instilling trust. It feels like I'm desperate, I need to make my quota, please buy something for me today. <laughs> All right. Say again? <laughs> yes, that is the truth, right? Right? But customers can smell that. Customers are smart, right? How many of us go into a store, see something, you open your phone, you like check out the price on Amazon or check it out anywhere else, right? All the time, right? You can't hide information from consumers anymore. All right, promotion words, free, bonus, offer, et cetera. So on nearly half of our apps use the word free. Um, uh, one seventh of our apps use bonus. Uh, it's used a lot of times. How do you think these words do? Tell me, which, which do you think are the best words here? Free bonus, sale, gift, offer, promotion, discount. Which are, which are like your top two? Okay, what do you think are the worst ones? I'm hearing the exact same answers. <laughs> That's awesome. That's why we must A-B test things. So bonus and gift are good, okay? Uh, sale, offer, promotion are kind of neutral. Discount and free are not so hot. We would discourage you from using discount and free. Um, 
Don't take away from the value of your product, but feel free to give people a gift. Give them a bonus. They like those kind of things. So yeah, bonus gift and sale do well. Uh, promotion is just on the line. Um, offer close to the line. Free and discount not so hot. Okay, again, last chance, last discount, no. Uh, same thing, oh, those are two different, no, yeah. Those were the, the um, areas of relative neutrality. Um, and this is, again, for small list sizes, but I think the data we saw the same, yeah, same data for even a larger list size. Bonus, gift, fine. Bonus is really, really, really good. Is that a question or just waving? No, I did the question. Sure. Mm -hmm. Talking about segmenting, like, a, like, are people taking a list of 50,000, segmenting down a list of 1,000, and then, or what? Why are you capping at 1,000 in the data? Uh, we're capping it because those were the buckets that, um, where the analysis made sense, but we saw con similar patterns of behavior between. So you'll see in the same um, range that the use of the word is better relative to the broadcast in that same group for that same number of recipients, but it's still better as a principle to segment it smaller and smaller and smaller. So you'll see the same effect for every list size. Okay. It'll just be more pronounced in the smaller groups. I see. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Was it segments of data or was it smaller lists? Because if I have a list of 25 people, they know me and they want what I have. Whereas a segment of list of 50,000 is going to have a different result. So the question was, was it segmented data, right? If it was a list of 25 people, they know me and they want the information. And what was the other part of the question? Right, so, so don't segment for the sake of segmenting. Segment for the sake of relevance and um, you know, intimacy in the communication. Right, was your data done with a smaller database with sending to the friends, or was it? No, 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 these were, these were broadcast sizes. So this was, and it wasn't necessarily you know, friends, it was whatever, customers in the system, but this was the, the size of the broadcast independent of the size of the major list. So if it was tagged and it was a smaller broadcast, that's to how many people uh, it was going. Did that make sense? Yes, um, but what I'm saying is I think that the data could get skewed because if I'm an individual with only a list of 32 people, right. I'm sending it to my family and friends and going, hey, dude, we got this stuff going on and I know you want it. Right. Whereas if I'm Best Buy and I'm segmenting to somebody that wants an iPod and I'm only sending it to 25 people, I'm not necessarily going to get the same result because I'm still Best Buy. I'm not Michelle sending to Dave. Correct. So the point there is it, it does not help you to take a large broadcast of like 10,000 and just split it up into 40 broadcasts of 250. That, that's not going to move the needle in any way, shape, or form. If I know that somebody, sorry, if I know that somebody wants an iPod because they bought one before and go, hey, we, right. we know you bought them before and we have them on sale, Right. whatever, I'm still going to get a different response than if I have a friend that I'm sending my stuff to. Does that of, make sense? Of course. So what my question is, is do you know if these are people with smaller lists or are they segmented broadcasts going out? Gotcha. Charles, what do you think? No, we, we don't know that. Yeah, to be frank, me, you know. Yeah, that's a good point, though. That's a good point. But that's why we do this bucket study. So that's why we do it. Cool. Another question? I believe that uh, what she was just sharing is it's all relative. If you have a personal relationship with a thousand people versus Best Buy and you segment it for people who like iPods and only send it to 85 people instead of the entire thousand, you still get the benefit. So it's relative, right. but you'll never turn a Best Buy relationship into a personal relationship just by segmenting. But it'll still perform better for Best Buy to segment, just like it would perform better for a small, intimate relationship business to segment. Well said, well said, cool. Question. I'd also, and I, I imagine you don't have this year, this year, but I'd love to see it next year, okay. is uh, the difference between emailing to a business, an individual that's part of a business, so a B2B, versus consumer. And if we can start maybe identifying that somehow in Infusionsoft, and I know you guys are going a little more that way, I think that would be hugely helpful for those of us in the B2B. Okay, so other, hmm, 
That's a, that's a great question. And we could immediately go to like looking at the consumer domains. Uh, and we'll, we'll take this offline and, and brainstorm through that because that would largely indicate an individual. But my personal email address is also a Google Apps domain. So we'll, we'll take that into and figure out if we can um, analyze the profile of the recipient and see if they're likely a business or likely an individual. Okay, we'll take that. Cool. All right, so um, don't devalue your offer, okay? Free discount, hurt open rates, but give them something as a bonus or a gift. Generally, that will get you a much better open rate through your email and then hopefully uh, a better conversion after that. All right, uh, so thank you for attending this session. I appreciate it. Uh, it's also important to show your customers gratitude and appreciation. So let me ask you, does saying thank you matter? Yes, of course it does, right? Your parents taught you well, you should say thank you. You should say thank you to your customers. It helps your open rate. So thank is in uh, about 30% of the apps, which is thanks, thank you, et cetera, thank you very much. Appreciate is in fewer apps and performance is not as good, okay? So maybe keeping it simpler is actually a, a signal there. So, um, you know, you can see on the right side, the bottom right, the, the better. And again, the, the um, behavior is seen no matter the size of the list. It's always better to say thank you, and it's always worse to not say thank you or thanks or anything else, okay? Simple, appreciate it. You could tell that to your parents, listen to them, say thank you. All right, personalization. Uh, the most common ways people are personalizing emails going out uh, is first name. Okay, first name or first name, last name combination, and then sometimes the date. Um, you see last name there, the company, month, etc. So does it matter, does it help, or are people numb to it? Louder. Helps. Helps? So it does. First name actually is the only one that showed a statistically significant impact. Okay, so the rest of the time I think people just see that, uh, okay, you know how to use merge fields, but they don't necessarily know that you're appealing intimately to them. But the name does trigger that. And that reminded me of a Dale Carnegie quote. Anybody know it? Most important. Close, somebody said sweetest sound, who said that? Yes, so uh, I'll share that quote in two seconds. But the, the uh, um, pattern, the evidence was seen consistently throughout any list size. And here's the Dale Carnegie quote, which really resonates. And I think um, those of us who've been in the business for a while, we see this. The, remember that a person's name is to that person the sweetest and most important sound in any language. So despite knowing that it's just personalization, it's just software, when you see your name, it still appeals to you. Okay, so please use it. Sure. Does it work better to put the first name in the beginning of your subject line or at the end? Charles, what do you think? We didn't check that. So yeah, we good, haven't. Good so we'll, we'll look at, that, <laughs> look at the, the placement of it in the subject line. I think we're all in subject lines, not in um, the body of the email. Correct. This is all a subject about. line analysis, okay. right? So yeah, sort of step one this year, 2017, is getting your email opened with a subject line. Next year, we'll talk about getting um, calls to action um, executed on in the body of your email message, and then how you can test and experiment more yourselves too. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Okay, keep them coming. All right, days of the week. What day of the week is the best day of the week to uh, to have your customers open your email? Thursday, Wednesday. Where are you getting this from? Where are you hearing it from, by the way? Guessing. You guess. Guessing's fine. <laughs> That's guessing's honest. Awesome. What do you think? Monday. Okay, so I love that some of you know that. I love that you're doing experiments around it. So the, the data we found by looking at you know, all of the, the distributions um, were that Sunday and Saturday performed the best consistently across any list size. Um, Monday generally being a close second, and we found that Wednesdays and Thursdays were some of the worst performing days. <laughs> crazy, right? No, this is crazy. That's interesting. This is what's crazy. The day you send email is not aligned with the day they open email. So this is the crazy part. If you look at the days of the week that you send the email, Saturdays and Sundays are the lowest work days, right? So flip that. Okay, sort of like, you know, easy money, 
just schedule a broadcast for the weekend or, you know, come in Sunday afternoon or Saturday or whatever and try sending your emails then and see what the conversion looks like. Okay, but that, that was a very dramatic difference for us, that the open rates were so dramatically different based on when you actually, based on when they were opening it and based on when you sent it. I see a microphone there. Did you analyze for B2C and B2B for that? Do we analyze for what? For B2B and B2C. No, not yet. We will. Yes. For sending or opening? Friday's pretty good. It looks to be just after Monday and a little bit, yeah. It's not as horrible. Um, and again, the list size had a little tiny bit to do with it, but what's most dramatic there is, is the weekends is, you know, a higher open rate. Correct. Correct. Now, maybe there's less noise, right? Maybe there's less competition. If I just think of myself on the weekend, I probably do look at more email, and I, I'm probably, um, when I'm busy in the week, I usually just, you know, don't even get to it or archive it quickly or... It's not getting to the top of my attention. Do you know if the time correlated at all? Like the time sent, the time open, the morning, if there was a proximity? Yeah, we didn't check that, but we will, yeah. Okay. She asked if there was a correlation between the time, the time of day that it was open. So next year we'll come back and we'll give you some data. Yeah. Um, and we, you know, we'll, we'll do something in the interim too. So we want to get into blogging more about this information, this data. So we'll start sharing some of this, that information as well too, like the correlation between time of day. And we know we have to rationalize this across time zones, which we've done a lot of work on. So we actually know the recipient time zone and we can tell if it is Saturday or Sunday or Monday, et cetera. Um, so we, we fortunately have that data now. Um, but we'll look at specific times of day to try to optimize it. One thing we're investigating very heavily, and honestly, we're not quite sure exactly what to do with it, is should we keep a profile of when that contact opens their email? And then is that owned by you? Or if that email address appears in more than one app, how do we reconcile sharing that information or not? So that's the kind of data sharing stuff that we really stress about because you know, it's your contact, it's your information. If you know that they open your email on Mondays, I don't think I have the right to actually tell another app owner that, yeah, Monday's a good day for them, right? So, but we do wanna, we do wanna know that information about that address anyway so we can do analyses for it. So it looks like from this data that, depending on the size of the list, um, Tuesday seems to perform pretty poorly, and Wednesdays and Thursdays, not so well either. Charles, anything yeah. to add? I think that uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday are the days that most emails are sent, so probably you got a lot of competition. That's, yeah. Yeah. And also one interesting thing we found out is that Saturday, Sunday, you do get a, a best open rates, but also you get the highest opt-out rate. So you ah. better send something good because people have time to opt you out. Yeah, so, it's a very good point. So send something <laughs> relevant and trustworthy. Yeah, they open your email, they can opt out so if, you, if the content sucks, so. Can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's, what, yeah. that's yeah. what we got. So basically here, we are comparing the, the, uh, the broadcast performance, the open rate performance, right? If you look at that bucket, right? So if you look at the second bucket, uh, 100 to 320, yes, Saturday and the Sunday, they have uh, open rate about 40%. The emails are getting opened. And for the rest of the days, it's probably around 36, 37%. So yeah. That's about three points. Th that's yeah. what we get from the data. I was wondering if you would follow yeah, this data through to see when people took more action as a result of opening or when the things were sent. Not yet, but we will. Are we looking at how this impacts culturally? I mean, if we're sending to China, Australia, the United States, France, I mean, other countries have different working schedules in the United States, how does that impact trends? So um, we can rationalize it by like time zone and whatnot, but we're not saying, okay, in, in um, Muslim countries, they take Fridays off, right? We're not, we're not looking at work weeks or work schedules like that, but that's good data for us to, to have. And I think we'd have to develop a profile of each recipient's work week. Um, even knowing that based on domain would be hard, but we can, we can take that and try to figure something out with that. Okay. Hello. 
Where? <laughs> Sorry, okay. Could you just define open rights? Because I've heard conflicting information. I'm sorry, louder. Can you define can you define open rate? Because I've heard conflicting information. Some people say when people just scroll, sometimes that is considered open rate. Define what you mean by open rate. Do this they really click firing the tracking pixel we use to show that the email was rendered? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear that. Please clarify. Does that not make sense? <laughs> oh, sorry. Let me translate that from geek speak. So, okay, so there's a, there's a, a pixel, a clear pixel. This is a common way that everybody on the internet does this. Um, that is sent along with every email. And when that email is opened and rendered, we get a little hit to our web server that shows that this picture, this image was rendered, okay? And so our web servers track the fact that that pixel has been rendered on your device. So it's been visually seen. So when would that not be rendered? If I'm in Gmail and I look at a list of my things and the subject line is not intriguing, I hit check, 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 archive, or check, 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 delete. Or if I'm on a device, I just scroll it to the left or the right. I don't, I don't actually click it open and render the body of the email. Okay, sometimes I've talked to people at Infusionsoft and I tell them my open rate, and they go, well, that really doesn't mean anything because they really might not have opened it. So I'm getting conflicting, conflicting information from what you're saying and maybe what reality is. That you can't count on them really opening it. So, so that's a the, very, very the way good point. It's served up on the at, at the at the end of the day, we'll give you the information on conversions and money. That's the most important thing at the end of the day, right? Until that point, everything is sort of a proxy. It's sort of an indicator towards that end result. So, yes, the data is imperfect, but it's directional. So, it it does it does indicate. It's not going to indicate perfection, but it is going to indicate directionally: is this going to work or not work? And then we'll keep going through. So, so the next part is, you know, have they read on it? Have they um, done the call to action in the email? When they landed on the landing page, how long were they there? Did they click on the buy now or whatnot? And we'll start to break it down. But sort of the first thing is, is it even getting to them? Are they even taking a look at it? And uh, are you causing them to be interested in it? And granted, it is, it is absolutely, we will confess, imperfect information. But it's still better than no information and it's still directionally accurate. So this sort of helps us with the subject line and the first couple lines, seeing if they, we have a higher chance of understanding if they opened it. This, this yes. analysis specifically with subject line, line, right? Okay. Again, keep, we'll, you know, every year we'll do it, we'll get better, we'll give you more better information, better fidelity, um, and we'll add better instrumentation to be able to figure all this out. But it's, it is, indicative of how you should start to think about these things and what to use or not use, and then we'll go down the funnel further. So we want to help you improve this part of the funnel, right? And that'll help the rest of the funnel as you go through. Okay. Yes, sir. When we select uh, send by time, time zone, mm -hmm. when we check the box to send by time zone, are you using the time zone on the uh, state on the zip code or the IP address of pixel firing from the last email? How do you guys track that? Is that Leonard back there? Leonard, yeah. Leonard, All right, we're going to give you the exact, <laughs> exact technical information translated. <laughs> so in the best scenario, what happens is, is when somebody hits one of our pages, in addition to keeping track of their locale, like let's say they were a French Canadian or something like that, we also keep track of the, the time zone. That's the best case. Sometimes the best case isn't, isn't what we're dealing with here. Um, you also have the option as uh, users of the app to actually go through and assign that. So if you have that information, that helps too. So if you don't have the information, do you default to Eastern time? If if we don't have the information, we default to your app time. You have the, whatever your, your preferred locale is for your app, we default to that. Okay. That is, that's like the dregs. It doesn't get, well, it can. If you didn't bother to set a, a locale for your app, yeah, then it's going to default to Eastern time. I think we, we don't even bother with the daylight portion of that. So net net, if they've opened a page and we've gotten data from them about their locale, that will tell us their, their language and their time zone. 
So if, if we have that page that's been opened by them, we can, we'll keep that information and cache it. And that's how with our international stuff, we'll know what to send to them. If we don't have that, then we'll use the time zone that your app is set in. You can also set this in the database. You can go and you know, proactively say all of my customers are in Australia, so I'm gonna set that. But otherwise, you know, we'll, the, the time zone. Over there. Um, in my email program and a lot of my colleagues, and I know a lot of our customers, they have it set to not open images by default. They actually have to click the button that says download images. So they may open the email, but they're not getting that pixel, is that right? And if that's correct, do you have any idea about like what is the ratio of people who have it set to download that pixel image by default when open and people who don't? Do we know that, that ratio? Not yet. No, yeah. So that's a, that's a very good point. You're right. A lot of people are not giving us back the data. But the fact that some people are gives us directional insight into what's working or what's not working. We can't thwart the don't send this image or don't open the image thing, right? So the only case, the only thing we can do in that case um, is two things. One is we have relationships with dozens of ISPs around the world and they give us deliverability data. So we do get some data back about what's getting delivered, what's not getting delivered, so we can you know, help improve your deliverability across the board. Then we'll have to look at the individual calls to action in the email and see if they clicked on it or did something with it. Because again, at the end of the day, it's revenue, right? It's conversion to whatever the call to action is. And we, you know, we'll work upstream from that, but now it's, it's just, are we even getting seen? And if the data is wrong for half the people, for, for one half that it's right for, it's still gonna give us the trend that we wanna look at. Okay, back there. I think I kind of already know, based on what you've said, where you're gonna go, but in addition to what we've already heard, are these statistics taking into consideration reading panes? Where if it's in the reading pane, the image will render but they're not reading it. They're not really quote unquote opening it because it just happens to show up in a reading page. Exact same problem, exact same thing, right? So yeah, again, these are proxies for what's happening. So I can't, I can't tell you with incredible fidelity that David at Pincus.com, my email address, opened and spent five minutes reading this email, right? The only way I can do this is if I sent an email before, yours, after, measured the time between, had some other Voodoo or Magic in there or a Chrome extension. And there are lots of people that are trying these you know, combinations, but this again is directionally based on a certain behavior for a certain number of recipients, what's working, what's not working. Um, it will lead you to the right thing. And again, we'll give you more fidelity. Okay. Is there a way for us to access reports on our app that are similar to this as far as days of the week and times, or even eventually, like I know there'd be something for keywords like you're showing us now so we can analyze our own data? That's a great question. Leonard, how far are we from being able to provide that information? I know we have some conversations with some of our reporting partners about making some of that data more easily available, but I'm gonna ask Leonard to chime in. Currently we're focusing on campaign data because that's where we're hurting pretty bad right now. As time goes on, we're hoping to be able to expand that uh, to something far, far better. And we're hoping to be able to hold onto that data for a significantly longer period of time. But not ready yet and I don't expect that we're going to be able to push anything out that's going to for campaigns anyways for about a month and everything else is going to be following that. Okay. That, that's an optimistic estimate. Okay. Cool. All right. We talked about this. How frequently? What do they expect? Good question. Good question. So your mileage may vary with this data. So this is the data that we're actually not super, super confident on, um, but we thought we'd share some of the information um, based on what's going on. So it seems for smaller lists, people are sending things around weekly, maybe a little bit more frequently than week weekly. The behavior, and we don't know how to parse all this quite yet, to be honest. Um, smaller lists, it seems that frequency is more relevant. Larger lists sort of out of sight, out of mind, but you remind them of you, like if you send it to them quarterly or every half a year. Like, they're more interested in looking at it if they haven't heard from you in a while. But for smaller sizes where you're developing a more intimate relationship, it does seem that frequency is, um, is more relevant. And then this is the open rate you see on the side. So if you're sending something to them weekly on a smaller list, it does seem to be getting looked at more frequently. So again, it's a little harder to parse. For smaller lists, frequency seems to be better. 
for larger lists, novelty seems to be better, and that means your mileage may vary by MMV. I would test this depending on your content, your list, your people, et cetera. All right. So um, quickly, list size matters, selectivity matters. Make sure it's really, really relevant. Um, last chance is never, never true. Anybody been in like a sales engagement and last chance, I'm never going to give you this deal again, and then tomorrow you get the same deal? Yeah. Right? Okay. Um, people know that. Uh, nothing is free. Give a gift. It's better. Uh, don't forget to say thank you. Uh, use their name, work on the weekend, and study frequency. So how can this be tested yourself? Um, with that, I'm going to pass it over to, to Charles. No, does that surprise you? Is this not your slide yet? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. I think you're going to talk about this <laughs> nice. <laughs> We worked on this part together, but I was just going to pass it over to Charles. Yeah. Okay. So yes. I think one comment I would like to make is that everything you see here are statistics. So there is a famous saying that all models are wrong, right? Some are useful. So even the worst performance, like the last chance, there are still 25% 20, of the broadcasts that perform better. So I think um, what we show here is, because we got a lot of data than each of you has, right? So that's the overall performance. For each of your own app, it may be different. So if you have a strong like evidence something works better, keep it, right? But if you don't have any strong evidence something works better or not, then you can follow our you know, result here, OK? So um, how do we generate all those results? We actually, we have to do something called offline experiment. It's actually a little bit hard to do because Imagine, right, if you have an email with a last chance, how do we compare its performance with other emails you send out, right? We have to find out that um, from your own email, right, you send an email with the last chance in the subject line, how do we say it's worse or better, right? We have to find all the other similar broadcasts sent out with sim to similar amount of recipients in the similar time frame. Then we do this kind of calculation. So a better way to do things is basically uh, online testing, online A-B testing. So how to do it is that you have to basically randomly split a portion of your contacts and apply different tags. Then you use Campaign Builder to, to, do, the, to do that. It's not the uh, most convenient way of doing it, um, so we promise we will make it better. But you know, if uh, there is an online tutorial of how to do that, if you have a large list, if you only have a small list, don't do it, because uh, statistically, you know, it won't be conclusive. But if you do have a large list, and then you can uh, try to do something like that. So um, basically, uh, for the rest of the talk, I'm, instead of talking about emails, I'm going to talk about some of the statistics. So we believe those are some useful concepts for you to keep in mind. Um, so basically, there are three short topics I want to go through. First, don't always trust your intuition. Think about last chance, right? Everyone thinks it's a very good word, and the data shows it's bad. And a lot of times, something may seem very obvious, but the data can see other ways, OK? And I'm also going to talk about uncertainty and the confidence. So that will help you to understand your A-B testing. And also, if you use other, any other tools, you know, you try to do your own testing on um, for example, on two different subjects or two different campaigns, you know, this uh, will help you to understand the fundamental statistics. And the third topic I'm going to talk about is avoid sampling bias, which is uh, very, very important. Um, so don't always trust your intuition. So this is actually my uh, favorite example. One out of 10 versus 10 out of 100. What do I mean by that, right? So if you toss a corn for 10 times, how many heads are you going to expect you're going to get? Five, yeah, exactly. So are you going to be surprised if you get four or six? No, nobody will be surprised because, you know, there are chances, right? So the chance, actually, if you get one or zero heads, um, it's about 1%, OK? So that's a calculation, you know? Um, so basically, every time you have a, 50% of chance of not getting a head. So the chance of you getting zero head, if you toss for 10 times, right, it's 0 0.5 with the power of 10. That's the chance you're getting zero head. That's about one out of a thousand times. And the second uh, number, I, I'm not, I'm not going to explain, that's the chance of you getting one head, actually. So if you sum it together. So I think if I ask everyone in this room to toss the coin for 10 times, I will get me, at least get one or two people that will get one or less heads. So 
Next question, if you toss a coin for a hundred times, the chance you get 10 or less heads. Uh, how many of you think it's about the same as the first question? Okay, that's, that's very good. Uh, how many, anybody take a guess if you don't think it's the same? All right, so here's the answer. It's almost impossible. Basically, um, if you ask everybody in the whole world, probably toss 10,000 times, you'll probably get someone who will get that. So that's basically what's, what is called by the law of large number. If you expect something to happen, it's gonna happen if you have a enough number of experiments. Next topic, understanding uncertainty and confidence. Um, I don't know how many of you have done, have you done A-B testing, but I'm gonna use one of our own A-B testing example to show you the concept. So we have videos on our web page, right? We want to know which video is better to attract, you know, interest, right? To, so we have original video, we have a candidate video one, candidate video two, right? So I don't know if you can see the numbers here. Basically, for, for the original video, imagine, right, when the visitor visits our website, we automatically direct them to see different kind of videos. So for the original video, we have like 50, around 54,000 visitors, and then 15, out of the 54,000, 15,000 clicked somewhere on our web page. We define that's uh, engagement, okay? That's how we define the success. And for the video one, it's, uh, you know, you can see the number, it's uh, about 14, uh, 15,000 out of 52,000. Video two, it's about, you know, 14,600 out of uh, 52,000. So what's important, right? We want to define which video works better, right? So if you look at the, the, the conversion rate, right? The first one is 27% uh, about, the second one 28%. 28.7% uh, actually. So the, the video two is about 28%, uh, 28.1%. That's all fine, we can all do the calculation, it's very easy to do. And then we have to conclude, right, which one performs better. So if you look at the video one, right, it's, uh, if you look at the absolute difference in the conversion rate, right, it's about 1.3% better. Relatively, it's 4.8% if you look at the this, the column on the right side, uh, the, the second and last column to the right side, right? It's 4.8% better, and the uh, video two, it's 2.7% better. So what I'm gonna explain is uh, the, the column on the very right side, statistical significance, right? So for the video one, it not only shows that it's 4.8% better, it, it's better with a 99% of confidence. What the hell does that mean, right? <laughs> it's better, it's 5% better. What the heck does 99% mean, right? I'm gonna explain that. So, because if you do this kind of A-B testing, it's very, very important to understand those kind of st statistics. So, for me to explain that, let's just look at the conversion rate for the original video, okay? Um, parameter estimation. No, let's just define the problem. Engagement rate, how is it defined for our problem? It's a number of visitors who clicked the page divided by the total number of visitors who see the video. Very simple calculation, right? 27.39%. What else can be estimated, right? So we have two numbers. We are getting one number, so we are missing something. 27%, you can say, oh, what else can be estimated? It's 27%. So let me ask you, if we have, instead of 50,000, we have only 500 visitors and 149 clicked, you are still gonna get the same number, 27%, right? So instead, we did a much more testing. Are they the same, right? If they are not the same, what's the difference here? So actually, it's a confidence in the number that makes a difference. So here are some mathematical concepts, like the pop. So firstly, why do we do this kind of calculation? The, we, even for you guys, if you want to do this A-B testing, why do you want to estimate something? Because you want to predict the future, right? You are not interested in the past. You are not interested in the past 50,000 out of those 15,000 clicked. You are interested in the future, okay? For my future customer, who are gonna convert, who are gonna, gonna, gonna engage, right? So we are trying to use our past, the past behavior to predict the future. 
So um, for this 54,000 visitors, you have 27.39% engagement rate. So let me ask you, if you do the same experiment for the next 54,000, what do you expect the engagement rate to be? Give me one number. Yeah, 27.39% if you have only one guess, right? But would it surprise you if you get 27.38%? No. Would it surprise you if you get 20%? Point two seven. That's that's a that's a good guess, um, but it's not the best. So that's the thing, right? So um, when we estimate something, we we have a number, right? We have a number. But another thing we need to have is that we have to give a wiggle room of this number. How confident we are? We all know that you know we are not gonna for the next fifty thousand. We are not gonna gonna get twenty seven point three nine percent. But what what do we expect, right? What kind of wiggle room does it have, right? This, mathematically, it has something called standard error or margin of error, okay? So this is actually defines the wiggle room you, you, you have. The more data you collect, the more experiment you do, the less wiggle room you're gonna, you're gonna have. So don't look at the left side, that's too mathematical. Just look at the right side. Okay, so here, the wiggle room for, if we have 50,000 visitors, it's about 0.19%. So meaning that um, I'm expecting, okay, if I do my next experiment, okay, for the next 50,000 visitors, I'm gonna expect the conversion rate to be 27.39% plus or minus this n, I'm gonna explain it, but if you take n as one, okay, so it's called one standard deviation away. This is 0.19%, meaning that Six, if I do the experiment 60, uh, 100 more times, 67% of the time, that's explaining the left plot, okay, will be in this, um, you know, 27.39% um, plus or minus 0.19%. If you increase the number of n, relax it the more to two, okay, then if you do the experiment 95, 100 times, you're gonna expect the conversion rate to be uh, you're going to expect out of the 100 times, 95 times, you are going to have a conversion rate between 27.39% plus or minus 2 times 0.19%. That's a standard error. That's a margin of error, okay? So, actually, now back to our A-B testing problem, right? So, um, if you look at the, the green curve, okay? Look at the middle point of the green curve. That's a video one performance. You are going to expect, right, for the video one, we got our number. Uh, the conversion rate is about 28 point, like 7%. But it won't surprise you if you move a little bit, bit right? And for, also for the original video, we get a 27.39%. Uh, it also won't surprise you if, if the number moves a little bit. So, but because we have done so, we have collected so much data, we are very, very confident that right? the wiggle room is pretty small for both testing. And actually, if um, the chance of randomly, right, the video, original video performed better than the video one, it's less than 1%. That's what the 99% confidence interval tells you in the original A-B testing result. Okay, and if you done the experiment with 100 times less samples, okay, you are gonna see this plot. Basically, um, it's not conclusive at all. Although it may appear, right, from the hundred of testing you've done, uh, one is better than the other, but it can just purely by chance. It's almost like if you toss a coin for 10 times, you get four heads, then you declare it's an unfair coin. That's, we know that's totally chance, okay? It's not something conclusive. Um, so again, now how much data do you need for your experiment, right? So basically, it's very helpful to remember those numbers. If you only do 10, um, if you, for example, if you want to collect some feedback from your customer, you only talk to 10 of your customer, uh, the, the, uh, the uncertainty is about 30%, okay? 100 customer, 10%. 1,000 customer, 3%. Actually, that's why every time we try to do a, like the 
president, president, you know, we just have a very interesting election, right? We have all these polls, uh, like uh, predicting who's going to win, who's not going to win. They have to do, all they have to do is they have to basically ask a thousand people, then collect, you know, the, the, the statistics, and then they declare a 3% of uh, margin of error with a 95% of confidence. So, um, avoiding sampling bias, that's going to be my last topic. So, I'm sorry for all the mess. Um, here's an interesting problem. Um, in the World War II, okay, the U.S. military was trying to determine the optimum amount of and the position of armor on the fighter planes and the bombers. So the U.S. military decided, okay, we do not want to use our intuition. We want to use data. So how do they do that? They basically uh, collect the data from all the returned airplanes, and then they check where the bullets are. You know, all the white dots shows where the plan was hit by the bullet. So where do you think you should put, because the thing is that you cannot put too armor on the airplane, right? If you put too much of it, the airplane is going to be too heavy. If you put too less, it's going to be too fragile, right? So anyone can tell me where, if you are the engineer, where do you want to put all, more armor on the airplane? Underneath the pilot. That's great. Actually, at that time, Everyone, all the statisticians in the U.S. military research, they have this data approach, in this data-driven approach, right? They collect this data. They are like, we have to protect where the plane was hit most by the bullet on the white area, right? Wrong, right? Because it's a best sample. Those are the planes that returned, okay? So for the black area, that's, when it's hitting that area, they, they, they all crashed. It's, it's a very, very good example. Actually, I read the, this example from a director of data science at Facebook. It's, it actually blew my mind. I, I made it wrong, so you are really great. Um, it, it can show many things, this simple example. Okay, so first, correlation is not causation. When you talk to your customer about something, maybe some customer hate you so much they don't even talk to you. <laughs> I, I don't know. Just the uh, same airplane problem, right? And also, right, this is a sampling bias. You did not sample all the crashed airplanes, okay? So, so just really, you have to think about things when it's, it appears so obvious. At that time, all the statisticians, just but one, they figure out this problem. So this is the last example I'm going to show. So um, we just have an interesting election. Let me show you the 1936 U.S. election. It's between FDR, Roseford versus London, right? So at that time, there was a magazine called the Literary Digest. They, they tried to predict who's going to win. What they did is that they reached out to about 10 million people. It's a massive sample, OK? US population at that time is about 128 million. And 2.4 million responded. They predict Roseford is going to get 43%. So, um, at that time, there's a guy called Gallup. He um, actually, uh, he's like, wow, why do you guys do that? It, it's going to cost a lot of money, and you don't need to do 10 million people to get some statistics, right? He, instead, because he knows how the magazine do the, uh, collect the samples. So he used the same method. He collected 3,000 samples. And then he predict that the magazine is going to predict Roseford is going to get 44%. Okay, so you see what I'm saying, right? So he predict, the magazine is going to predict that Roseford gets 44%. It's really, really close. And then he used his own samples. Predict Roseford is going to get 56%. The end result, we all know that, right? It's 64, 62%. So what this story tell us, right? So why do you think the magazine gets it so wrong? Why do you think so? Exactly right. So if you think of at that time, right, how do they reach out to their readers? By telephone. Who can afford a telephone at that time? Republicans. Okay, so you got a 20% bias when you do the sampling. So the same thing, if you talk to your customer, try to collect feedbacks, don't do bias sampling. It, it will seriously 
uh, make you draw the wrong conclusion. So don't do convenient sampling. You know, because I can reach out to them very easily, right? That's my feedback. Don't do that. It's convenient sampling. It's not a reflect of the truth at all. So um, I think that's enough math I'm talking about. So I think, um, yeah, that's pretty much. Um, uh, I don't want to go through the, re I have the rest of the talk. It's a few more math. Uh, instead, I want to leave some time uh, for questions. OK? Yeah. If you guys have questions and want to come up to the mic, I think that'll make this a lot easier. As she's coming up, um, afterwards, we'd love you to come up and tell us what you'd like to see in the product that'll help you make some of these decisions and analyses. So if you have a feature you want to see or you want to see more stats and broadcast, you know, come up afterwards and say, I'd like the product to do X, Y, Z to help with this. So I'm, I'm hearing the statistics and all of that. Now, one of the assumptions that I'm, I'm curious about factoring in or out is when you send stuff to your list and there's, there's a difference in performance it would seem in A-B testing if you're sending like the same campaign over and over to the same amount of people on your list. Okay. The novelty, I'm thinking, the first time you do it, it would be higher, but if you then repeat it over time, the same message is like, oh, I've seen this before. So how do you factor in the, the repetitive nature when you're talking to your list? If, you don't, if, you're, if your list is constantly growing at a certain percentage, then, then that would be statistically significant. It would seem that you're gonna have that variation, but if your list, say, isn't growing as quickly and you're sending to the same people, mm -hmm. I would think that that would impact. So how do you factor that in? No, you cannot, right? Because uh, the, the, one, the one thing about A-B testing is that you have to compare apple to apple. You cannot compare your current performance with previous performance. If they already bought from you, if they right, already done something. So what you, the, with A-B testing, what you do is that, okay, if you want to evaluate two campaigns effectively, you have to do it at the, at the same time. So then the, the only thing you do differently is that you have to randomize your recipients of that two campaigns. Then, you, for example, if you have 10,000 recipients, you pick 1,000 for one campaign, 1,000 for another campaign, you do that, you evaluate the effectiveness, and then you pick the better performing campaign to the rest. That's so what I'm saying is even in the better performing campaign, like even if you do that yeah. simultaneously, even in the better performing campaign, what I'm curious about is that becomes your control and then you're testing it the next time. What I'm wondering is, is that better performing campaign actually still going to you know, outperform because you're going to send it out as the control the next time for the split testing? So is it going to skew it because it's still, even though it was outperforming, it's repetitive then to the same list. So is No, I, I don't think it's going to be repetitive because okay. um, it has a time dependency. It has a dependency on the past behavior. Okay, thank you. Yeah. What, did, were you saying you were going to send the same email message multiple times? What's that? Were you just going to send the same email message multiple times? Well, in this example, if, if it's outperforming, then theoretically you would want to use it again. So, that's, so yes, that was if you're wanting to you know, relaunch something and then use the control as yeah. the... But not to the same recipients, only it new would people. Be, well, if it's to your list, it would be to the same. So you don't want to send the same thing to the okay, same people that was multiple my point times. Where yeah. you could, I, I, and it's the yeah. same message, you know, even if it's six months later. Let me, it, let me flip it around for you. Let's say you're an engineer working for a large email company, and you're building the algorithms to detect spam. If you get an identical email message to the same email address a little time later, do you think you should let that through or not? No. Right. So that's because it's not as trustworthy to send the exact same thing to somebody a week or a month later. Right. So you should, so the scenario you described, that's my, that's my you point. should not get yourself into. You right. should be sending them new, relative, right. relevant that, content. That's my point in the A-B testing. It could give you a false sense of confidence that, oh, this one did better, so I'm going to use it again later in the same campaign, but you can get yourself into trouble due to the repetitive nature of that being sent. So, so look at the differences between the A and the B see what they were, and then take the lessons from that, and then use that to craft intelligently the next communication you send out. Right. Technically, though, shouldn't it be, 
in, in pure A-B testing, only one variable should change. That's right. But then, if you, but then if you use that same variable as the control, that's where I'm saying is you can get into trouble unless you really know what you're doing with the split testing. Yeah, what she said is you should have three groups. Right. You know, the A, the B, and then leave the, the rest. rest. Okay, thank yeah. you. Uh, can you just talk really quickly about the sample that you chose? Uh, like, how random was it? Uh, who is exactly is in there? Uh, is, like, I'm sure there's a mix of B2B and B2C as well, so like, I'm just trying to get a little bit of a, an idea of, of, of your sample itself, where you got your data from. Do you mean how many people? Not, not just how many people, but kind of like how you chose it, right? Like, how random is it? Um, like, I mean, a lot of questions that we had tonight were, where is it BTC related, is it B2B related, and so on and so forth. So if we can sort of get an idea of who these people are, um, I'm obviously not asking for names, I'm just asking like, how randomly selected is the sample that you chose? Um, I, I think, uh, I'm not exactly sure, I understand your, so how random is the sample we choose then? So it's a very, very, very large corpus. Uh, you know, it's 30 million, no, 30 billion. Yeah, um, we have like, that a, went out, like so. collected uh, 3 billion broad, sending out to 30 billion recipients. So, and then, um, yeah, I'm not sure, because we, we just collect all the data, and I, I'm not sure uh, what you mean by how random is the sample. So I think what we'll do for next year is we'll, we'll go to our, our email um, dev team, so email software engineers, and we'll ask them to build a profile for every recipient if we suspect it's a business or a consumer address, and then come back and, and share information split by that. Yeah. So it'll be imperfect, but it'll, it'll be mostly largely correct. Like we can look at your domain and, and you know, basically infer if you're a business or uh, a real person. Again, if it's, if it's at Gmail, it's gonna be very hard for us to figure that out, but we'll, we'll try to give you some better fidelity on that next year. So you're saying that you'll tag your recipients as businesses or consumers? Oh. Sure. Okay, maybe come up afterwards and let's talk through how we could, how we could make that available. The, I think they were waiting online, so let's get their questions first. I just want to know if we have access to this PowerPoint. I'd like to share some of the data in the beginning with my team. Um, we would love to share it. I don't know how we can share it yet. So. Um, we come up afterwards yeah. and uh, give us your email and we'll figure out how to like make it available. Okay. You mentioned uh, A-B testing and size of list and you said a large list. Mm -hmm. I've been resisting doing A-B testing because you know I didn't think I had a statistically big enough list. Yeah. So what's a large list? What, how do you... Uh, oh, yeah. Like, where do you uh, draw the line on that? Depends on how... Let's say, for example, if you have, it depends on the performance difference, right? If you have something, um, have, for, let's say if you have two, two, two emails you want to broadcast, right? Everything else is the same. You want to test which email subject line is more effective. So let's say you have a few hundred of recipients. You, you may probably send, you know, a few hundred, it's, uh, it's not the ideal this size, but if the performance is so different, let's say one is 20% better than the other one, that's statistically significant. But if it's one is only 5% then better than the other one, it's not. Because you only have 100, the, 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 the margin of error is 10%. So on the, otherwise, right, if you have a large list, let's say 10,000 recipients, right, then if you can have one is better, like if you send two, same thing to two group of people, each group has 1,000 recipients, the margin of error is only 3%. So if one is better, 3% better than the other one, that's conclusive. You see what I'm saying? Okay, so it it's really depends on how much performance better, uh, which one is performance better, how much, is, you know, what's the difference between the, the two groups? There, there are some good online tools to show you the number, uh, the size of the list and where statistical significance is. So as we figure out how to get this deck out, either via a blog post or something else, we'll add some of those links. Um, you said something kind of disturbing to me earlier about the email having the same subject line. So I'm thinking the whole purpose of going through this is to find the ones that people open and use them over and over again. And we have a client that um, they sell pies at local markets. So we have a list of uh, people that live in that neighborhood that want them. 
and want to know when they come into town. So we just send them an email going, hey, we're, we're at the market, come down and visit us. So what you're saying is if we keep sending out that email, even though we get an 80% open rate on it, because obviously people want to know what's in town, that the engineers are gonna start flagging that and those emails aren't gonna go through. No, if, if you have 80% um, open rate, don't change a no. thing. Right, that's perfect. <laughs> my, well, yeah, my, 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 my point is if, if you say, we will be in town this Sunday selling pies, yep. and you send that exact same thing over and over again to the same people, eventually that might get flagged as something that's not relevant. If you say, we will be in town this Sunday, May 24th and 25th at Fred's Market, selling peach cobblers because peach is in so season. you have to keep randomizing the subject line every month. Don't, so that it well, you're not randomizing it. You're making it contextually relevant, right? Yeah. The, the date, you're making it relevant and important. So just by changing the date, that, that would not? Yeah, I believe, I believe there you're increasing the trustworthiness of your email and the relevance of the email. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. So relative to the uh, split testing, I, I understand a lot of fusion folks are having on the sides of the list and how to come up with the best subject line. And one thing I learned uh, from Native Commerce, one of the digital marketer companies, is what they do is they take their list and they'll take 10% of their list and send out uh, an A-B split. So 5% would go to one okay. subject line, 5% would go to the other. They do that at 7 a.m then they see which subject line performs the best an hour later, mm. and then they use that subject line for the remaining 90% yep. of the list. So when you guys are talking about coming up with a subject line, if you don't have a big list, you know, standard deviation, et cetera, is yep. definitely a factor, but if you've got a thousand person list that you're doing an A-B split test on, and like Charles said, if you have more than 3% improvement on one versus the other, you're good, but you can't send it to your entire list. Yep. You, you can't send out an A-B split test to your entire list and really right. have as much value as if you send it to a small portion of your list, maybe have less significant data, yep. but you've got a better chance that the remaining list that you're emailing that day is going to benefit from that if you see a big difference between the two subject lines. Yeah, yeah, you definitely want to always right. use a different 5% because yeah. if does, not, does you're... Does IS have a way to randomly select that 5% or no? What, what we do with ours is we, uh, we actually uh, have a random number generator using right. API guys. We put in a custom field mm -hmm. and then we use the uh, decision diamonds to say if uh, what we call our throttle field, if it's less than 50, go here, if it's more than 50, go there, or whatever threshold that you, you set. So that way we'd never, and we change that decision diamond every time we select a, a population to test on. That's a plugin that you use? Um, yeah, we use, it, it's in the marketplace, API guys. And I think uh, Six Division uh, Plus This has ways to do that too. Okay, that, that's a great way to do it. Yeah. Uh, I think one comment I would like to make is that, yes, that's, I mean, even like it's not st statistically significant, right? If it one performs better than the other one, you may still want the, you know, even the nominal performance, right, is better. Take your odds. Yeah, exactly, take your odds. Um, my comment is that it, sometimes it totally depends on the cost of doing it. If there's no cost, yeah, go ahead, right? If there's any cost associated with it, you want something that is more, statistically proven, right? And also, I mean, why in statistics you always start from the null hypothesis? Because things tends to doesn't matter. Like, right, the thing is that, you know, email subject lines, you know, we, we, we have thousands of words, right? We find few that matters. Thing, things tends does not matter, okay? Because people like for me, right, um, when I the way I decide if I want to open an email or not, a lot of times it's depending on a lot of other things, right? So that's why we all, always start from the null, hyp null hypothesis until you can prove something is better. So, okay, yeah. Um, so I have two things. First, I wanted to share a method that I use for split testing because the company I have has a fairly large list. I will export all the contacts that I'm going to do and just export the contact ID. Mm -hmm. And then you can either put a tag ID or a number, you know, if you want to split it into 10 groups or five groups or oh. whatever. Put one, two, three, four, five, and then 
you can sort of copy that right. for the rest of the sheet right. and then re-import it and either apply the tags that way or update a field value that way. And it's way, way, way faster than doing the campaign builder by, I mean, sometimes it'll take eight hours in the campaign builder and it'll take four or five minutes to update the tags. So that's a good method. Uh, you just have to be careful of how you organize because if you do it mm -hmm. by a contact ID and it's just in order, it'll be like the date the contacts were created or something. So you have to get creative in how you organize that. Uh, and then my question is about subject lines. Uh -huh. So we send out a newsletter and every time we put the same thing in brackets at the beginning of the newsletter to sort of signify that it's the newsletter. Mm -hmm. Do you think that could negatively affect deliverability? Um, I'm not sure. Can <laughs> yeah, um, we have to test it. Yeah, but I, I didn't see anything, you know, like, you know, if you put the same thing at the beginning, it's going to hurt it, but um, I didn't see that. But, uh, you know, if it helps a lot, I, I'm really not sure. I need to see the data to, to tell you that. Okay, thank you. But thank you for sharing your tips on the... On yeah, the if anybody wants to know more about that, they can talk to me. I'm happy to show people how to do that. Okay, cool. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks, Appreciate sir. it.